Hi, welcome to Ethereal Mechanics behind the scene in recent developments. Sorry it's been a long, long time. There's been lots going on. Uh, we've done the low voltage test of the high voltage generator. I'm going to switch to a video of that right now. Hi, this is the low voltage test of the high voltage generator. This is the 12 kilovolt generator which is developed from the Cockcroft Walton type design. Normally this generator is going to be driven from 175 uh, volt DC power supply but for the purposes of testing out and checking it out I'm driving it just from a regular 12 volt supply just to make sure that everything is hunky dory before we go full full power and that turned out to be a wise thing to do because some of the transistors were in backwards um, and these types of transistors at 12 volts aren't going to be damaged but 175, 170 volts it would have been a pretty interesting firestorm so it was good that uh, we did a low voltage check first and the other reason for doing a low voltage check is because when you have to get in there with all these scope probes to find out what's going on and what's wrong, there's a high probability you're going to shock yourself if you've got high voltage in there. It's driven from two phases from an Arduino. And all I'm doing is driving the one phase from a regular tra uh, TTL square wave generator. And over here is the scope, which is revealing the signals. The blue on the bottom, that's the TTL input. And it looks a little crummy because, hey, this is not the best TTL generator in the world. The yellow is the output of the, tr the high voltage tr driving transistor. The 0 to 8 volts is what that signal level is. That's going to be upwards of 100 volts when we apply the real voltage. The pink is the output of the step-up transformer into, into the Cockcroft Walton uh, a diode capacitor ladder. And the green is the output at the top and right now you can see the output is about 300 volts. That's pretty respectable from a 12 volt source. Now I'm going to switch this camera. I'm going to switch the frequency here um, to a much higher frequency. And you'll see that our, our voltage is going up and up and up and up. Very clean signal at the output going into the Cockroft Walton, which I'm very happy about. So if I dial this back, we can see a nice classical response. A classical response on the upswing on the pink and the magenta, and a classical response on the downswing. Uh, this is a very good information. Uh, we're going to use this. This is called a step response. We're going to use the measurements of the step response to model the system in order to develop an optimal Arduino drive signal input. Uh, which we have a little bit of flexibility with because we have two phases. So we can cycle these two phases in, in such a way to affect a better input. So that right now, that is the initial test. This other output here, the third output on the right, that's what the Arduino reads, the output voltage. Uh, for every one volt appearing at that point, there's f at that port, there is 4250 volts at the output, which is a little brass ball that isn't normally at the top. I got it open so I can put a lead on it. Uh, one thing about using these little drawer knobs, these solid brass drawer knobs, you got to make sure you take the lacquer off. I nearly electrocuted myself because I couldn't read any voltage. I totally forgot that these things have a lacquer coating on it to protect them from uh, tarnishing while they're in the wrapper. Uh, you need to remove that tarnish uh, before you use them, otherwise it could give you the false impression you're getting no signal when in fact just below the tarnish is 400 volts. Um, so just a word to the wise if you use uh, uh, solid brass dr drawer knobs as your electrodes. Uh, anyway, and I have the other grounded electrode here as a spark gap just in case it doesn't go over a thousand volts. I believe that little gap there, since we're about five thousand volts per inch, that little gap there is probably around a thousand volts. Uh, that there more to protect my instruments here because these these little meters here can't do more than a uh, thousand volts before they cook. Um, and my uh, high voltage oscilloscope probe which is attached to it can only do 2,000 volts. So uh, we want to protect our equipment in case this thing worked a lot better than I had expected. So anyway, that's where we are right now. We've got a lot of Arduino work left to do before we can drive this thing properly. Uh, I'll see you later. I expect to do the high voltage test on the weekend of the 2nd of July. I still have to write the Arduino controller a routine for it and to control it across the uh, new networking scheme that I've developed. I developed a new networking scheme. I called it PicoNet, uh, but I just looked up online and the 
term PicoNet is already taken, so I've got to come up with a na new name for it. Basically what it is, it allows you to, to uh, network together a whole bunch of Arduinos, and the Arduinos will automatically route the messages. This is used as a serial port and I'm going to have an application in C-sharp running on a PC that can listen to each of the different sensors you might have on different boards. And this takes care of a lot of problems I had. What do you, how do you have multiple boards all connected together? How do you get messages from, let's say, a high voltage generator, control a magnetic sensor, an accelerometer, a real-time clock, whatever, whatever. Whatever sensors we need to run the experiments in the lab, I need to be able to control them and get all the data back from them so I can record them on a hard drive record. And I'll make these things available as soon as they come off the line, but the, 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 the network thing was holding me up. That took me about three weeks to get working right because, uh, you know, it's just I got very little time to devote for it. But now that it's working, it's working pretty good, and I got an application working that can, you know, use the regular programming port. Because uh, what, what Arduino allows you to do is once you, you upload the Arduino code, it, are, it uploads it, but then it relieves the, the serial port open so your another application could come in and use the serial port to talk to your board, which is really nice. Okay, and then, um, you know, with the Arduino Mega, I've developed it so you can route the other three serial ports to go to other boards, or you can daisy chain from one board to the other, and the routing will take care of where all the messages go. So, again, because of the new networking protocol, there's Arduino-based sensors on the way. Uh, one of the reasons that this is helpful is I can offload the job of a display to the PC. Because where I was going before, I was going to have a little LCD board for each one of these, which is going to be a lot of work and a lot of expense. And the, the LCD board takes up a lot of I.O. pins. You really have that, not that much left afterwards. And it's very, the way that the LCD board attaches to these, it really makes them difficult to work with. So um, if I can offload all the display to a PC, then I don't have to have you guys, if you want to run these experiments yourself, um, I just send you software for your PC and the PC takes care of all the display stuff. So that's going to make life a lot easier and uh, less expensive. One of the next sensors on the way is a magnetic field strength. I need a, a, a tool to measure magnetic field strength. I have an old legacy tool which I'm going to use to make sure this is working right, uh, but I only have one of those legacy tools left because it was something I produced about 10 years ago and you know it's the only one left. These we can get pretty easily uh, you know, on, on Amazon. They're like ten, nine or fifteen dollars, and then I'm going to marry one of these up to a three-axis accelerometer and a three-axis gyroscope to try to, to attempt to make a wand that you can just wave over a magnet and be able to model the magnetic field. But you know that's one of those things we don't really need that. That would be a fun to have thing more than a need to have. Uh, my vacation's coming up in mid to late July. I've got two weeks off. I've got a lot of house maintenance to do and I'm developing a task schedule so I can make sure progress, lots of progress happens uh, on ethereal mechanics at that time. Uh, you have homework. Someone sent me a link to are you a quack? Well, I guess there's a question mark in there. Uh, and this is written by someone who believes themselves to be a real physicist, whatever that means. Uh, I'm going to put the link up there once I post this. And some of the points with him I agree with. Some other points I disagree with, but I, I understand the frustration this guy gets. Uh, your mission, your task, is to determine which rules of acquisition the writer is violating. Also, observe where he's in violation of his own argument. In other words, we're a case where the pot is calling the kettle black. Uh, I will post a revised list of the rules of acquisition shortly in the comments section of this channel. I'll send out. It'll go, if those people that are subscribed, there obviously when I post something in the comment section, it'll go out to you. Thank you for your patience. Thank for those who are donating. Uh, I expect as things may not look like they're moving fast, but a lot of development is going on in the background. There's a lot of support things that we need, like the PicoNet or whatever the network name I'm going to call it, and uh, software for doing other things. So it's getting there. It's, it's just so much work. It's one person. I've got to do everything. Thank you. No more voodoo physics.